Hello, how's everyone doing? <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Myra Sutton. I'm with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, if you don't know what EFF is, we are a digital rights organization based in San Francisco, California. Uh, we've been around for almost 25 years defending users um, in the courts, in the policy making spaces, on the internet, um, and we work on privacy, free speech, and uh, also intellectual, well, I don't want to say that word, copyright and patents. Um, so uh, I work on the international team, and um, I, my title is global policy analyst, but I like to call myself an international copyright activist. And um, the main thing that I've been working on and fighting is sort of this trend that um, has been going on before I've been an activist at EFF, which is copyright policy laundering. Uh, copyright policy laundering is where uh, industry folks work with governmental actors uh, to uh, use the opaqueness, the, the secrecy of international policy making spaces to pass copyright policies that would not survive um, in the public light in democratic policy making spaces if they were truly democratic. Um, so one recent example is of course uh, TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, Agreement, which is a trade agreement across uh, 12 Pacific countries. Um, and it includes everything from the criminalization of anti-circumvention measures, uh, expansion of copyright terms, uh, ISP liability provisions that would lead to people's content being taken down without a judicial review, um, to new provisions that we saw from two weeks ago from WikiLeaks um, that would include provisions like the CFAA, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act that was used to prosecute uh, Aaron Swartz. So um, it's very, very dangerous. And a lot of these provisions sort of have a long history from uh, the World Trade Organization's uh, trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights to WIPO's copyright treaties, which was then copy and pasted into the Digital Millennium Copyright in the US, um, and then uh, to many of these bilateral trade agreements and then now these gigantic trade agreements. That's a very quick timeline of, of, these, uh, of this history. Um, but there are two main issues with this sort of trend, right? Um, the reason why many of these copyright provisions keep appearing over and over again is because of the secrecy of these policy making spaces. There's no official release of negotiation texts. There's no detailed uh, public statements about what they're actually trying to get or what they're negotiating. Um, and oftentimes when there are public statements, they're very misleading or they're not accurate. Um, and uh, there's extremely limited participation. Um, I can talk to you afterwards if you'd like to hear about what it's actually like to try to go uh, to these negotiations and try to impact um, the, the talks. Um, but I can't go that into that now. Uh, and the second part is the corporate influence. So. Um, you know, we believe in balanced copyright. We believe there should be some incentives, some protections for creators, but of course that balance is very, very off right now. And we all, well, maybe not everyone agrees with that, but um, that's, what we, that's what we say. And part of that is the process. Um, and the process um, involves, amongst many things, is something called trade advisory committees, which, are, um, which was a way for at least the US trade representative to make the process more open. But what has happened is industry actors are able to see and uh, comment on the text in live time from any computer, anywhere they are, um, because they have to sign a non-disclosure agreement. They can't tell anybody else about what's in there. Um, but of course, public interest groups, uh, one of our, our tasks is to tell the public what's going on, and so we can't sign these agreements that would make it a crime for us to tell the public what's going on. So despite making them more open, it means that it becomes more captured by uh, industry interests. Um, so in light of this very, very secret process, um, what are we to do? So one way I've been uh, doing my activism is what I like to call peer-to-peer -peer activism. Uh, some people have said that peer-to-peer -peer is sort of an old-fashioned or sort of, you know, um, not so popular way of putting it, but I do think um, that we uh, can use the power, like the internet, of decentralized autonomous actors working together um, to change policy. Um, and it's not going to happen from one country or another, it's going to happen by us all working together. Um, and so my definition is autonomous organizations 
working together in a decentralized, collaborative network to share resources and expertise to achieve a common goal. So I'm going to go through two layers. Um, I'm sure in the EU there would be sort of three layers due to regional uh, politics and the EU, but um, for us in the US there's sort of two layers to this. There's an international layer. Um, and so on the international layer, it uh, looks different from the, from the sort of domestic national layer in that uh, we organize across national borders um, on common policy issues. So uh, one example is the Transatlantic Consumer Dialogue, which is a, a, a forum for uh, EU and US uh, consumer rights organizations to uh, issue joint policy recommendations, uh, letters. We um, look at you know, the, the transparency, or obviously lack of transparency, of things like ACTA or uh, TTIP. And then we, we say, um, look, you can't, you can't pass policies and regulations that act in the uh, public interest if it's so close, if we always have to have this guessing game where we don't understand what's going on. And so we have regular meetings in Brussels and DC, Washington DC, to tell policymakers um, you know, our analysis. Sometimes that's you know, based upon leaks um, because that's all we know from these agreements. Um, and, and we try to influence these policymakers. Then there is a, a fair deal coalition um, which I founded with uh, several leaders from TPP countries. We have a Japanese uh, digital rights organization, Peru, Chile, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, um, which is unfortunately not all the uh, TPP countries, but wherever there is a digital rights organization, we've, we've, got, we've sort of uh, got them together, we've got us together, and we've created a platform for people to um, sign this international petition. Um, as well as uh, do things like next week, we're holding a public teaching on, on Google Hangouts um, to tell everybody about what are the international sort of implications of the TPP's copyright provisions. Um, and we also do uh, luncheons, actually, for negotiators. So, um, for example, a couple months ago, um, there we found out, so, uh, the TPP negotiations were first supposed to happen in Vancouver, and then everyone said, oh my gosh, Vancouver would be great, there's all these you know, NGOs and public interest groups to influence policy, and then suddenly, about two weeks before that negotiation was supposed to start, um, it was moved to Ottawa, um, which is the capital, and we said, oh no, like, what are we supposed to do? And so we, we sort of hurried really quickly, and we organized everything, and we are like, how much, you know, how much money can your organization pay for this lunch for negotiators? Okay, and we all just pooled our money, we pooled our expertise, and we reached out to Michael Geist and Howard Knopf, um, copyright policy experts, um, to then speak to negotiators about what the implications are of, of some of the copyright policy provisions in this agreement. And we had a full house of negotiators, so we had this room and it was just packed, it was you know, hot and sweaty. And, um, and so the Japanese negotiators were you know, writing really furiously and everyone, it was very clear that the negotiators don't get enough input from the public interest. And so they were clearly very, very interested in hearing the alternative uh, perspective on what these copyright policies mean for uh, the public interest and for the economy and everything like that. So clearly there's a need for that, but we, you know, as nonprofits, we rely on member fees or grants or whatever, so we don't have that much money to throw around to, to throw these events like maybe industry groups. So uh, we often have to pool our money like this and our, and our resources. So there's a national layer. So on the, international, on the national layer, uh, we work with diverse interest groups to then oppose the trade process itself. Um, what that looks like is um, something like uh, the Stop Fast Track Coalition. So in the United States, um, there's something called Fast Track, which is um, where Congress, which has, uh, under the U.S. Constitution, has the power to set U.S. trade objectives, so you know, what the U.S. wants from other countries and their trade objectives. Um, but almost every agreement, even ACTA and TPP, have been negotiated as if it has this fast track. So then the U.S. trade representative can sign off on these agreements, negotiate the whole thing, and then get this authority to then uh, pass it through Congress with, with very limited debate, with no oversight from Congress, and really, really restricts any remaining democratic oversight into the trade process. Um, and so uh, TPP expired a few years ago, actually right after ACTA. Um, and so we're trying to stop it, and I'm working with environmental groups, access to medicine groups, 
um, labor unions even, and we all sort of understand that we have a common interest in stopping something like TPP, something like TTIP, um, and God forbid if ACTA ever comes back as a zombie, <laughs> um, uh, that it will be stopped as well. Um, by, by making this process much more uh, onerous and complicated for the U.S. Trade Representative to then be accountable to Congress. Um, and so we're, I'm working on the international and this uh, national layer. So the benefits of this approach, um, of course, we can sort of agree to work on common goals despite being you know, very different organizations, sometimes being in different countries. Uh, we can have direct influence where we have political leverage. So, you know, if you have a, a, a domestic issue like fast track, it's not going to help that we have international, you know, petition signers to be directed at Congress. Um, and it will also maximize our very limited resources uh, as, a, as nonprofits to uh, impact policy. Um, and so I like to call this, you know, using the internet to save the internet. We... Uh, can't do any of this organizing, any of this national or international organizing, if we don't have, you know, email, we're constantly emailing each other, or chats, or um, anything like that, because, um, you know, it's just a way to communicate, and it's just sort of natural for us to communicate news or whatever um, through the internet. And so, um, and I believe this way we can try to save the internet and save um, ourselves from making even worse copyright. The question is from now, how do we make and fix uh, copyright uh, from here on out? Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be around after and I can talk to you about all the TPP's provisions and everything. Um, so that's it. Thank you.